Now we are excited to introduce Professor Peggy Myo Young Choi. We have been planning Professor Choi's visit for two years, and this fall she accepted our invitation for online residency. So thank you, Professor Choi. As a, a, a choreographer, scholar, activist, and through a life of dance, Professor Choi makes a significant contribution to the field of dance through her unique work that integrates Korean and Japanese dance, martial arts, and Afro-Asian intersections, while calling attention to the crisis affecting marginalized voices, particularly women's voices, in the context of our endangered environment. Cho is Associate Professor of Dance in Asian American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, also director of the Peggy Choi Dance Ensemble and founder of the Kai Project Inc., a nonprofit organization that supports creative thinking and intercultural performance for future generations. Cho has performed regularly in New York at the Kennedy Center, Dance Place and the Smithsonian Institution in DC, the Kennedy Theater in Honolulu, and internationally in Jakarta, Seoul, Havana, Prague, and Berlin. Professor Cho is the author of articles including Anatomy of a Dancer, Place, Lineage, and Liberation, Return of Islands Back to the People, The Legacy of Struggle and Resistance in Capena and Capena, and Dancing Outside the uh, American Dream, History and Politics of Asian Dance in America. It couldn't be more timely that Professor Peggy Choi will present uh, today, Age of Fire, Woman of the Scarred Earth. For this event, uh, many people did a, a lot of uh, great things to make this event possible. And I wanna particularly acknowledge uh, staff of the NAM Center, Kate Clem and uh, Evan Bao. Um, we will provide closed captioning, but if you wanna hide the function, you can use the setting in the Zoom toolbox. Tool, uh, toolbar. And after the presentation, uh, we'll have uh, Professor Emily Wilcox, Associate Professor of Asian uh, Language and Cultures at the University of Michigan, who will moderate the Q&A session. Please join me welcoming Professor Choi. Thank you, Professor Kwok. And um, thank you for all of you who are joining me here. I hope I'm visible. Let's see. Let me check. Sorry. Okay. Thank you again, Professor Kwok, and to Kate Clem, uh, Evan Bao, uh, all of those who worked so hard to bring me here for really a couple years of planning. Back to Dohi um, and Professor Semi O, oh, who first made the connection here. So I'm very grateful and also. I um, want to thank Professor Fang Fei uh, Miao for so warmly welcoming me to her class and her students. I had a delightful time with you and um, it was very special for me to make the connection with you as well. So to start out my um, program, I am going to play a water drum. It is a Korean water drum just for a bit. And then I'm gonna move, uh, help us all move together in some um, key movement. Okay, so I'm gonna step away from the laptop, reposition it. Okay. So this is my, um, I'll have to adjust my camera, sorry. Okay. This is my hope that we can all uh, be of the same heartbeat. So, uh, and, and focus on our breath. And then uh, I'll just play for a little while and then we'll move together, okay?
Okay, now I'm going to play some music so we can um, get our bodies moving before we start in earnest with the, um, my talk. So everybody, why don't you stand up and find a comfortable place to stand. Um, and I will start some music and just try to follow along. The movements will be very simple uh, and just follow along. And the main point is to really relax together it has been a hard week, I think, for many of us, and we're just going to relax together, breathe together, and um, hopefully feel together, okay? So find a stand up, and I will start the music and then adjust my camera. So have your feet apart, just be firm into the earth. And then let's just lift our arms to the side and breathe down. Really relax the whole arm, sitting up with the elbows, floating down with the hands. Again, inhale. Exhale, bend your knees, softly. One more time. Inhale, both arms up. A little higher, and now float them down. So just follow along. Inhale. up, press to the sky, and circle the arms back down. Okay. Okay. 
So I hope you're feeling a little more peaceful. And um, so, so today my, my presentation is in honor of the elders. So try to think of someone who is your elder that inspires you and um, connect with that person. Uh, and, and I really uh, honor the elders who are women today because we need to elevate and hear them speak, uh, hear their stories, hear their wisdom, but not only their wisdom, but we have to hear their struggles. Those who have struggled really um, throughout their whole lives to protect and sustain the land that they live on. We need to hear what they want to say to us. So um, I'm going to start my slideshow and let me see, I hope I can. I hope that's okay. So Caitlin, <laughs> is that okay, everybody? Can you see it? Okay, anyway. So I hope you all can see it. Um, Peggy, Peggy, yeah. we're gonna need you to press uh, the share screen button at the bottom. Oh, okay. So I have to share it. Yeah, I just can't quite, let me see, sorry. Okay, got it. Oh, we, we still can't see it. I know, I'm gonna share right now. Just let me know if you can see it. Is that better? Okay, Looks now it's great. Looks now great. Fly. Okay, great, thank you. So I may need these little coaching things from Kate. Very grateful. Okay, so um, when I first came to Wisconsin many years ago, many decades ago in the 80s, late 80s, um, soon after I got here, maybe a couple years later, I met Frank Anakwad Montano. Montano, and he is a master flute or loon flute maker, musician who can play all kinds of music from rock to blues. But the reason why I'm remembering him today is that he told me that we are in the seventh fire. And he told me that Whoever has wisdom needs to share it with whoever asks. So that's always stuck with me for all these years and I often think about that. And I think that no other time is it so important, the words that he said. So I think, you know, let's try, try to renew. I'm trying to renew to find good meaning in that myself that those who ask for wisdom from those who know, you need to share your wisdom. So Patty Lowe also introduced me to Edward uh, Benson, Benton Benai, who wrote the Mishomis book. It's a very important book. Um, and he speaks to us with the voice of his people, the Ojibwe people, Patty Lowe's people as well. So it's a beautiful prophecy book about the seven prophets. And she also, Patty also talked about that. Um, yeah, and I, I just wanted to add that he speaks about these two paths. And I think Patty also said that. And questions is one of those paths that we have a choice to go on, is it the path of technology? So I think it's an interesting question. I think um, he didn't answer it, but he merely asked the question because he felt, you know, the first one of the two paths is um, a path that has led to and is leading to a damaged and say seared earth. So 
and Patty, as Patty said, it's in contrast to the slower, more traditional path, uh, the spiritual path. And I think that the younger people, the young people right now are changing in what you think about is technology. You're redefining it for the world and you're going to keep redefining it for us as you go forward. And I think that the main thing is to remember the intention of the technology. Is it a tool or an end? So, um, you know, I thank Edward ben Benton um, Benai for reminding me of that important question as well today. So let's listen more closely to women's stories, listen to what they are saying, Let's try to quietly listen because we need to give up the energy to instruct, to say that we know better and join to support the women who have dedicated themselves to care for this land and the waters on which they live. But how to listen more closely? You know, that's a big question. So in Korean, the Korean language, we have a word and it's maum. It's really two words put together. It means heart and mind, and you can't separate heart, mind. So the Chinese also have a character for heart, mind. And um, that's how I think I can listen, with my heart in close relationship to my mind. They're inseparable. And you need to be quiet to ha have that synergy occur. All right. so. Um, Looking back, you know, this is a wonderful, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I kind of get to review my life and work. And it was uh, interesting to me that when I look back over the work I've created over two decades, um, I think my dances often call or challenge, it, challenge audiences to look more closely at injustice and the causes to use um, Edward Benton Benai's words, the causes of damage and searing of people as well as the earth. So for me, my dances or creating the dances have been a means necessary for me to locate and confront violent oppression and express the effects of the violence and to connect through my body with those who are not included in the dominant narrative. Um, my dance making is really my digging into the earth below the surface with Mao to find the suppressed stories, even my own suppressed stories. And through dance, I examine not only the obvious opposition or enemy of the people, People, those who dominate the center because of, you know, giant political and economic greed. But I also try to examine honestly the insidious complicity, the comfortable ways that we all so easily fall into numbness or disoriented living on stolen land founded on white supremacy. And I'm kind of referring to, again, Edward uh, Benton Benai's words. Yeah, okay, so I would like to join with voices all over the globe who believe that one, um, that one, the one root cause of the ongoing persistence of systemic oppression is the extreme disregard for the earth, for the plants, for the animals, and even the microbiome. It's the energy of the, of the whole nature, nature's energy that is being disregarded. And particularly the places where we find ourselves living, a disregard for our own daily environment. Um, we fail, and I'm including myself when I get real busy, I fail and we fail to connect our breath with the breath of the plants, 
the trees, the air, even the microscopic structures of the mycelium, the fungal networks. Through my dance practice, I work to coordinate my breath with the breath of the universe, to the air in the room and to the breath of even the vegetables I've planted and harvest. Through my dance, I examine past stories of injustice, like an historian, the history of unjust scarring. Through space, I embody the discomfort, but breathing with my body, breathing through my body, even if I'm embodying the discomfort, I sometimes have the experience of finding an opening, a gate to pass through to more deeply understand what is at stake. And I hope to communicate to others at a deep, intimate level. So globally, those who are in powerful positions don't connect heart and mind. They have lost their empathy, caring for the people, and I would guess that they have severed their connection with the natural cycles of the earth and even with the grass that grows outside their homes, severed the relationship with the trees they can see through their windows. And in the Mishomis book by Benton Benai, Edward Benton Benai, uh, he does ask, Again, you know, this question of why is that? Is it because we've chosen the path of technology? Okay, so, um, you know, I want to think back to a time when I had a performance um, many years ago, actually, in the 1990s. Um, that I called Women of the Scarred Earth, Age of Fire. So it was the reverse of today's title. And I connected with my cousin, Trina. I'm not sure if you're out there, but if you are, I'm glad you are here. I connected with Trina, who um, had been part of a hula halau, a house of hula, on the big island in Hawaii, uh, called the Halau o Kekuhi. And I wanted to invite, I had so long admired this halau, and had wanted to invite uh, Puanani, Pualani rather, Pualani uh, Kanaka Ole kan, uh, Kanahele to perform in my concert, Women of the Scarred Earth, Age of Fire. And she did come. She brought her daughter, Ke Kuhi uh, Kanahele. And um, it was, yeah, an amazing experience. But when through the course of talking and planning to come, Pua shared with me that, you know, when I said the title is Women of the Scarred Earth, she said, well, you know, scarring is part of nature's cycle. Um, it is really natural for things to tear down and die and come back to life again. And that really struck me. And so for many, many years, even today, I think about what she told me. But I also think about how the Halau o Kekuhi and their lifestyle is really closely connected to the land that they are on. And in fact, they take very seriously their responsibility for honoring the goddess Pele, the goddess of fire, and to guard her home, the volcanoes on the big island. So I think that they are in a great position to teach us something and we need to listen to them. Um, so the volcano, its eruption is really a great example of this cycle of scarring uh, that she talks about. And, you know, the lava can go anywhere. It can explode. It can roll over highways. It can cover homes. And, and it's just um, has its own spirit. Once the lava, oh, sorry. Once the lava cooled, it gets very black and hard. And yet out of the cracks emerges 
the beautiful, sacred, special Ohia Lehua flower. It's a red flower. It's, it's, it's connected with Pele and her, her um, strength. It's believed to bring rain and um, this idea of out of a desert of hard black lava can again renew itself with the Lehua flower. So then I, I'd like to ask, like, when is scarring too much? You know, when does it become a sliding, uh, down a sliding slope that you can't stop? You know, and, and so today I think that we are really witnessing that um, through the COVID pandemic. In fact, the climate crisis is, if we believe the scientists, is very much closely related to COVID. Uh, it's directly related to the cr climate crisis because, and the result, it's because of this resulting diminishing biodiversity and that there are many reasons for that, why that's happening. Um, so I also want to pair up at the same time, the climate crisis, the lack of biodiversity is linked with that we know that through COVID, um, everyone is not equally affected. There is a justice question and we know that the people of color, uh, the poor uh, are more likely to be affected by COVID. So, you know, we have to always think of that. What is the justice for earth? What is the justice for people? And can we right now, 2020, moving into 2021, can we repair this relationship, this broken relationship? Um, how do we start stop scarring others or at least scarring less uh, how, how do we do that if we continue to want to dominate and you know out of arrogance so i think there are some things that do hold us back and we need to look at that honestly okay so i'm going to move on to away from the the power of pele and the lava that sprouts allows the lehua to come up, ohia to come up. I'm gonna change focus to my family, my family history. Oh. So my cousin Gail, I think she's out there, hello. <laughs> my cousin Gail was the first person to inspire me to know, to want to know, to be curious about my family history on the Huang side. So my mom's family is Huang. Gail is my first cousin. Her father is my mother's brother and Trina's mother's brother. So um, Gail was the first person to be interested in her own family history. And she doesn't stop, you know, she doesn't do anything halfway. And many of us who know her, her friends included know that about her. And, um, she started early on having conversations. This, she said, told me this is the first time she started interviewing our grandpa, Sasan Huang, and that's his second wife, Oksuk Huang. So she began with this picture to interview him to find out what his struggles were, you know, what his scarring were, was. I don't know if she asked it like that, but I think it does come out because he talked about the Japanese occupation and how you know, many of his friends were killed and tortured. So that's why he had to leave as a political, uh, in polit and go into political exile. So, um, okay, so then they leave. And there's my grandma, um, Huang, uh, Huang, I mean, I'm sorry, Chang Tasan. she's in the middle. And there's my mom on my grandpa's lap. There's Paul, Gail's father. And there's Elizabeth, Trina's mom. And they left uh, from Siniju at the Northern border between Korea and China. And uh, in the dead, it was like um, half frozen river. The Amnok river was half frozen. And so it was probably early spring. Now, Chang Dasan, my grandmother, was pregnant with Paul. 
and yet they had to flee. So they disguised themselves in Chinese clothes and made their way to Shanghai where they took a ship to San Francisco. So my mom and Elizabeth were born in Hawaii. I mean, not Hawaii, San Francisco. So they reached San Francisco and Chang Ta San, I mean, the Confucian ethic, Confucian ethic in Korea at that time was, you know, you protect the women and they don't go beyond the front gate of the house. But here, Chang Ta San was forced to go and in fact run out of the gate of her front yard. And um, I always thought, well, I started to think if she could do that and cross the half frozen Amnok River, knowing that the police could come up and kill them at any time, she must have had great courage because she's not in the history books. You know, my grandpa, uh, our grandfather is, uh, and I think it's largely through Gail's first efforts, but she is never talked about. And from her picture, I feel that she's a very quiet person. But I started thinking, you know, her courage must have been equal to any revolutionary independence fighter. And she just did it without accepting pr any praise or, um, you know, any, she wasn't never felt sorry for herself. So I created a dance in her honor called Ice River. So this is a picture of it. And it's that moment where she has to tear herself from her family and leave forever, probably, right? They don't know if they can come back. So I'm gonna play a clip of that if I can get to it. Okay, yeah, it goes on to another, the, the true story of John Henry. So we'll stop right there though. Um, okay. Um. Okay, now let me think. What do I have to do? Caitlin, I might need your help to advance to the next slide. Yeah, no problem, Peggy. You can use your arrow keys on your keyboard or your presenter view. A presenter view. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you see your presenter view window? Oh, I see. Right. Okay. Yep, there you go. Okay. Okay, and then I can just hit my keyboard to go down, right? There you go. Okay. So after they get to um, San Francisco, um, my grandpa, uh, Sa San Huang, who's sitting in the first row, second from the right, next to An Chang Ho, the Korean patriot, um, he gets to San Francisco and expecting to feel free, like a free man. But in fact, he no one wants him to be a teacher, which he was in, in North Korea. I mean, yeah, in, in Shiniju, no one wants to hire him. So he then goes and finds any kind of work, pick, picking tomatoes, uh, being a houseboy. And uh, yet at night, by night, they were really um, organizing to develop leadership in the Hung Sadan organization since uh, started in 1913, uh, started by An Chang Ho so that they could return to Korea, a free Korea and take on leadership to build a new nation. Okay, let me think. Uh. 
Okay. So um, it was quite, I imagine that their lives during the first years of their time in San Francisco was not easy. As I said before, um, Chang Dasan had the triple burden of cooking, cleaning, raising children, and yet helping her, um, you know, since um, um, Huang Sasan was minister of the one of the first San Francisco churches, she had to welcome anyone into the house um, for, you know, who from the Korean community. So really at the age of five, um, Chang Ta Sun, my grandmother and my mom's mom dies. And we don't know how or what it was, you know, in those days it was called exhaustion. So the grieving, you know, my grieving grandfather cannot handle three children. So he sends the two girls off to Hawaii to be taken care of by his sister, his younger sister, um, um, Hesu Huang. So the two girls get on a ship and leave. And they come to Hawaii at a very, uh, you know, a very strange time in a way because it is a colonial time when Queen Liliokalani had al also already been um, illegally deposed. Uh, and this was in 1893 uh, with at the point, rifle point. She's forced to abdicate. She becomes, she gets under house arrest and is imprisoned in her own palace. And that had happened in 1893. So this illegal occupation, colonial, uh, you know, condition is what my mom came to and Auntie Betty as well. But then they put down roots. So, uh, you know, she, my mom has left Hawaii. I mean, sorry, left San Francisco, not knowing what is gonna happen. Uh, but she manages, she grows up in Hawaii, in Honolulu. Tutu, or as we know, you know, Tutu means grandma in Hawaiian, so we know her as Tutu. Tutu becomes both father and mother for my mom, Mary, and her sister, older sister, Elizabeth. And there's my mom, probably college age with Hesu on her right. So my mom actually learns to love what we call in Hawaiian, the aina. She learns to love, and she spoke to me of every time I went home, she would say, oh, look how beautiful the trees are. Look how beautiful the valley is. She always talked about natural beauty with me. So I know that she truly loved it. And how did she transform that sense of place and love for the aina is she became a supporter for an independent Hawaii. So she, um, became very, you know, she was supporting independence rather than sovereignty. And she, countless times, protests, uh, you know, supporting pig farmers in Kalama Valley, getting arrested, going to prison, you know, for overnight. So my mom became, um, you know, energized to help and help support in whatever way she, she could, not as a leader, of the um, political movements in Hawaii, but as a supporter. So I think that's how she expressed her love of the land. My mother also told me, you know, my mother was really ahead of her time. She was so open to LGBTQ rights and women's rights, women's rights, empowerment. And one day she tells me, Peggy, you've got to make a dance about the comfort women. And I said, well, who are they, you know? <laughs> so I did my research and then I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna make a dance about the comfort women. And I don't know how, I, I, I'm not sure if all of you know who, what they, who the comfort women were, but during World War II, um, women and girls were captured in Korean factories and in their homes and taken off in trucks and taken to the front lines and forced to become sex slaves to the Japanese military. And th these were not only Korean women, there were about 200,000 Korean women, but they're also um, 
Singaporean women, Chinese women, Filipino women. And, um, you know, that's why I kind of resisted because it was such a horrific, as I did my research, it was horrific. And Comfort women, you know, in their 80s were reporting that they had been raped 100 times a day. And, you know, it's just without words of horror. So I resisted, but then I felt, you know, my mom is wise, she is an elder, and I'm gonna listen to her. So I did create Comfort Woman. At first it was for the Korean Comfort Women, but now um, it's become my sign one of my signature dances. I've been dancing it since the early 90s and I last performed it, as you see in the photo, at the San Francisco Chinatown unveiling of the Comfort Women Memorial in 2017. So on the uh, pedestal, you have three women linking arms, uh, Korean woman, a Filipino woman, and Chinese woman. And on in the center of the photo on the ground is an elderly Comfort Woman, also Korean. So uh, it's been really a piece that I didn't have any idea that I would be dancing for all these years. And um, yeah, I'm gonna show you a clip of it.
I continued with the theme of women and the Afro-Asian bridge to our common or shared possibly intersecting experiences with kiyashe stories from the belly. Kiyashe is a composite word in two languages. So ki is internal energy in Korean and Japanese and ashe is from the Yoruba language, uh, which has the same internal power meaning and it's stories from the belly. So I made, uh, created different stories um, sharing um, courage and leadership. So Nongge, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Nongge lived a historical figure who lived during the Japanese occupation in Korea. Um, and she was like a geisha. So in, in Korean, we call it gisang. So she would serve tea and what entertained the Japanese soldiers when they came to the, the, the tea house. But she, she lured them in and I think uh, as I recall my story, she poisoned them, you know, so she was um, kind of a freedom fighter of her own, in her own way. And in the same piece, Kiyashe, um, Diane Harvey Salam uh, was Sara Unya. And I, I think Diane had to leave. I'm not sure you're there, but if you are, you can see this. Uh, we played with um, the idea of shadow puppets. Uh, so live dancer behind the screen waiting to come on as Sara Unya. And Sara Unya, which really means queen, was not only a queen, but a priestess in um, the late 1800s. And she led an army. So she was also a, a martial artist, a successful uh, uprising against the French colonialists in the Battle of Lugu in um, uh, Eastern Logos. And she led the Asnans to victory. So that is just, um, you know, also a, an example of uh, a dance of courage where the woman doesn't even think about what she can't do. Um, I have so few things from this concert, not documented, so this is what I have. And then just to show that Diane Harvey Salam was so um, beautiful and welcoming when she wor has worked with me. And she that was way back in, um, at Dance Space in New York in the, when was it? Um, 1990s as well, and she's still dancing. This is a very recent picture to show how strong she is. And this is Diane Harvey recently. She remains a very special friend to me. And um, just, I'm taking her Ma'at Mat, which is her version of um, Pilates and she's taking my Qigong class. So we're still sharing. Okay, and I'm just going to show a clip from another work um, called Thirst. And um, Thirst is about captivity, forced captivity and resistance to oppression. And it, it came from a um, research that I did and I found out that African-American workers were hired on the docks of Baltimore, which was how many African-American workers were hired up. And they were shipped off to this island of Navassa. And that's a small island in the Caribbean. And the bad thing about it is there's no running water on the island. So it had to be brought in. And what these uh, African-American workers did was they mined guano seagull droppings in the late 1800s. And they would have these four year contracts or maybe six years, but none of them, you know, many died before they could fulfill their contracts because they were asphyxiated by the guano fumes, huge mountains of guano. So they could not fulfill their contracts. Very grueling, hot uh, sun, cruel bosses, um, so very, very bad conditions. And um, uh, finally, I, I researched that there was an uprising, a revolt. So the men could not take the stress anymore. And 
there was an uprising and at the end of the uprising, three of the bosses were dead. And um, eventually three of the men, the, the workers were uh, brought back to Baltimore for trial. And um, uh, at the time, this was in 19, I mean, sorry, 1889 when the revolt occurred. And in that same year, Benjamin Harris, Harrison was running for president. And he, you know, they were actually sentenced to life, I mean, to death, the death penalty, but no one was there to um, stand up for their rights. No, of course, no lawyer. But then Benjamin Harrison wanted to be elected president. So he said, well, you know, I think I'm gonna be, uh, let's, let's change the sentence because I wanna be a good guy. So I'll get elected president, the 23rd president. So he commuted their sentences to life in prison. So to this day, you know, um, it is a situation of injustice that has not yet been looked into. So now I'm gonna play a clip from this thirst. You see women also in the picture here. Uh, I had to imagine what, how they could stand it for even three years or even four years. How could they stand these conditions without going crazy? So I had to imagine that in their dreams, they were visited by the goddesses of the water, the waters, because you know you get so thirsty without running water. So they would be visited by these goddesses who gave them strength to endure and to continue on. So that's an imagined situation that I created. And um, you'll see at the end, um, a older um, actor, Kim Sullivan, playing one of the uh, prisoners for life. So he's in the end of this, you'll see him in stripes. So he's reminiscing his memories and he's even dreaming these dreams of his time on Navasa.
Okay. So um, during uh, 2013, I um, created a homage to Muhammad Ali, and he actually has been one of my heroes because he was unafraid and he did make the connections across the Afro-Asian connection of refusing to go to Vietnam to kill what who he said were his yellow brothers. So I created this homage um, focusing on transformative moments in Muhammad Ali's life. Um, one being when he was 13, Emmett Till, at, who was 14, very close to him, was lynched. And this made a huge impression on Muhammad Ali. So that's in here. And then uh, the other moment was when he lost his boxing uh, license because he didn't go to Vietnam, wasn't drafted. And, um, but he, he persisted, uh, you know, he, he never gave up his drive and he then came back um, and won, trained hard and won another a world championship. So you can see through the subtitles, but this is the greatest excerpts. Uh, I did use some women boxers, but basically I used, I mean, um, hired male boxers from Gleason Gym where Ali himself had trained and um, B-boys from New York. And so really I feel like from a woman's point of view, this is my victory of entering a very male dominant space and surviving <laughs> with success. Stars wasn't about reading for parts on stage. Stars rumbled their bright existence across earth, struck jabs at lives pressing them down. But this one street, a furious comet. What kind of fight can fight against the fire of boys like me? getting put out every day. I'm light. I won't be forgotten.
Kumbaya in a sea of faces like mine. My brothers, my parents, my cousins. This is what we come from. What we can be. Flight is, was a different um, inspiration from 12th century Sufi poetry by Attar of Iran. And um, it really had a sense of fluidity, of gender. Um, all of the dancers were dressed in bird attire. <laughs> and um, the nightingale, who we usually think of as a sweet voice with um, as female, it's really a male that sings so sweetly. So the, um, all of the birds don't like each other. These are the parrots. They're different species, nightingale, heron, hawk. They don't get along. But then the um, nightingale inspires them that he has experienced ultimate love, 100% love, and he wants them to experience this as well. So if they follow him up to the highest mountain in the world, they will find the rose of love. So that was my interpretation of Attar's poem, a selfless sacrifice, no desire for earthly power and greed for economic gain. It's all about love and compassion and willingness to sacrifice yourself, your own life for that. So that was a hard lesson. I mean, I still have, have to you know, wrap my head around that. It's really something that will constantly be challenged to me. But the dancers, um, okay, I'll just let you watch it. And, and there's an old man character played by the parrot, double role on the right, LaCour Yancey. And that old man is a wise man, but he's homeless. He's one that you see in urban areas walking around in rags. And he's, he has wisdom, because we talked about wisdom of the elders at the beginning of this. He has great wisdom, but he's very bitter because no one listens him, to him, no one notices him. His ego, alter ego is the phoenix who rises out of his ashes after he burns himself up out of frustration. And, and the phoenix is um, the guide to help the birds continue to the end of their journey, even though so many drop away through death and you know injuries and stuff. So only a very few birds make it to the top.
This brings us to the last dance that I'm going to share with you. It brings us back to the opening of, uh, of my presentation with Patty Lowe. And um, Patty, generous spirit, always there. Such a generous spirit that, you know, I can't really tell her enough how I appreciate that. And um, she, I had invited her to be on a water panel. And that, uh, this was quite a while ago. It was maybe in 2000, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it was quite a while ago. So, and then it was there at the water panel that, that um, Patty shared about the problem of the threat of, of the Gogebet mine that was going to be built in the Pinocchio Hills up north in Wisconsin, very near to what is called Bad River. Uh, and that's where um, the Patty's, um, the, you know, the, the, the um, Bad River tribe of the Lakes um, Superior Chippewa uh, Indians live. I, I might've messed up that name, I'm sorry. Okay, so anyway, so Patty was the one who drew my attention to this problem and I was really disturbed by it because it was imminent that this company had been trying since 2011, I think, to do this. They were gonna do it um, in 2013 or something, but it was still very contested by um, the Bad River uh, group and, and tribe and their chair, Mike Wiggins has been very outspoken nationally for standing up for protection of their own land. So I asked Patty, can I create a, a piece about this problem to, uh, you know, if the Gogebet mine came in, the Bad River would be polluted. That's where their wild rice grows and they are the guardians of that wild rice. It is central to their ceremonial, spiritual, and also economic livelihood. And the Gogeb mine runoff, cheap iron ore, would also pollute Lake Superior, one of our most pristine lakes. So, she, you know, Patty gave me an invitation to do so. And I then created this wild rice dance that you'll see just a short excerpt from. Um, it is not my intention to in any way represent Ojibwe culture. It is really as an outsider acknowledging and calling attention to this. Um, imminent, you know, this threat that every day the people of Bad River have to live with. Um, and, and now in 2000, I mean, recently in 2015, I think, the Go Get Big Mine stopped its plans. The company stopped its plans to build this mine, but there are other threats uh, like pipelines and things. So it's just, um, you know, I can't believe how people have to live on edge every day because of the threat to their own land that they should hold in peace. Okay, here's excerpt from Wild Rice. When the spring snow splays the worry, leans me, shielding doubt about 10,000 things. I dread the snowmelt barren weakness. I long for the river to roll back the curtains, past the sunflowers, traffic and berries, moon by dawn, trouble by day. Okay, um, so that's it for the slideshow. Um, I'm going to perform just a short improvisation for you. Um, and I'll just take a minute to share my music. No. 
Okay, so the music is um, traditional Korean um, shaman style singing by the great Kim So Hee. This is one of my pieces of music that never ends or stops to inspire me. It's very deep and Koreans know about this word of Han, which is kind of like eternal pain and suffering. So um, there's a sense that, you know, we have to, even though there is this sense of eternal pain and suffering, we need to never give up hope to stop it. Okay, so here's my improv on, um, let me find my music, I'm sorry. So this um, improv is called Blood. And there are many interpretations of blood. I was speaking to my um, child, no, that's not it, um, Milo, and they were saying that blood is brings life, or if it flows out of the body, it brings death. So it's really my conclusion for today. You know, how do we want to think about blood? Um, if that makes any sense. Okay, so still having to get this up. Here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna take a second. I'm gonna turn off my camera for a second to get ready and I'll be back in 30 seconds. Okay, here I am. I think it's all good. So I'll start my music. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Choi. Uh, this has been an amazing pleasure and inspiring on so many levels. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Emily Wilcox. I teach in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures and I specialize in um, Asian dance studies. And it's hard to believe we've never met before, but I'm just so privileged to be here to moderate your discussion. Um, so I know that we have one question already in the Q&A from Diane Harvey Salam, and we also have a question from Fang Fei Miao. Um, I wanna invite others who have questions to put questions into the Q&A chat box. Um, if you feel comfortable typing them, if you'd prefer to ask it orally, you can use the, um, the raise hand function um, in Zoom. So you can use either option. Um, so if it's okay, I'd like to just start with um, a couple of questions of my own. Um, as a dance scholar, I think um, we sometimes face uh, misunderstanding for people who are less familiar with dance, who may associate dance with um, you know, entertainment and, and primarily beauty. And I think your work shows us and reminds us of how dance can be such a powerful medium for um, addressing social injustice and specifically using dance as a, as a space for activism. And so I wanted to, for my first question, to ask you how you see dance really serving as a particularly powerful tool um, for, the, for social justice and activism. Um, and then secondly, I was very curious, um, I was just very impressed by the range of your work. Um, and I wanted to know what inspired you to, um, to do the Afro-Asian themed work that seems to be a really important part of, um, of your career. Um, and then my last question is, um, of the work that you shared today, there was a, an amazing range in dealing with so many different issues. Um, the Comfort Woman piece especially, I found um, really um, very moving. And I was wondering if you had done any work on um, your own experiences in the contemporary United States. We didn't see that in any, any of the pieces that you showed for today, at least as the explicit theme, but I wondered if that was addressed in any of your work or maybe as a less explicit part of um, your work. And if not, if you wanted to share why you chose not to address um, those topics. Um, so I know that's a lot. Those are things I was thinking about during your presentation. Yeah, great questions. Um, you're gonna have to remind me of what they were. So. Um, let's start with the end one, like you said, contemporary work. So does that mean contemporary events? Like give me um, an example. Yeah, I guess I meant, um, so you were dealing with what I saw as other people's uh, experiences of injustice. And I wondered if you dealt with your own personal experiences of injustice that you've faced um, in your life. Yeah, I, you know, that's, um, I, I've never been autobiographical in my work in, in an explicit way, but um, as I teach my students, I really feel that your body is a vehicle and to express a story, which is how I teach my students to express a story, you need to fill it with your own life. And so it's always present. Even the Muhammad Ali piece, uh, the greatest, I filled it with my own passion and, um, you know, my own drive I, I, to, to do something that was very difficult. That was one of my hardest projects, working with all that testosterone in the room all the time. And Diane knows that. Di <laughs> Diane talked to me many times about this when I was in New York with her. Um, okay, so that's, I, I really feel that whether the story is directly about Peggy Choi, which I don't really, I don't actually feel too comfortable with that, but maybe one day I will, right? piece like Peggy Choi. So, but I feel that my personal um, emotions, I have to fill the choreography with it. And then that's how I direct the guys, you know, they may be boxers. And if I don't see that power, because I know I have it, you know, I mean, I, I, if I don't see it, I ask for it. And, um, you know, I think one good example is something Gail just recently told me, my cousin, uh, the power that I think if one looks to your own lineage, you'll find it. Um, so my grandfather, um, Sasan Huang, told, he said to Gail in one of the interviews that he was so in awe of his older sister because she, Sasan Huang, had been married to a man as the second wife. 
And then she um, was exposed to Christianity, which was telling them that females had the right to be educated. So she said enough of this, um, you know, this stuff. And she left him and got on a donkey and rode home. So I think that that persistence, you know, whether whatever gender, whatever sexual orientation you have, you know, that spirit um, is very important. And I really feel that that's the precious thing that I try to put into my work. So what was the first question? Um, about dance as a vehicle for social justice work. How do I feel about it? Yeah, what makes dance especially powerful? For that? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I think everyone can argue that maybe writing is just as powerful because we have great authors that can um, bring alive an experience. But I think that there's something really intimate and deep about moving the body. And that's why I kept talking about embodying, you know, like through my breath, um, I can find, a, you know, a gateway into understanding. And I really feel, and you, you may, you know, have your own opinion about this as a dancer and teacher too. I mean, not a dancer, but dance scholar, is that there's something very deep that can be relayed in an instant without interpretation, without intellectualism, without an, anal an analysis that can actually change the people that you are dancing in front of. And it's an exchange of spirit. So I'll feel the audience. And even in video, I can kind of feel, you know, <laughs> that's what I think. So there's this exchange of energy through the whole body that dancers really train. They train to have that every cell alive. Um, that's why I think dance is so special and it can actually transform um, behavior and attitude. So when I showed my video of the comfort woman in one of my classes, like really a long time ago, I didn't prepare the class and I never showed it again. I just showed it one time and I didn't tell them even what it was about. And then afterwards, a female student came up and she said, you know, she had been uh, raped and that video helped her to start healing. So after that, I never felt like to response. I felt response. I couldn't show it again, but it was very moving that she could actually feel something through the video that helped change her, her own life. Wow. And then what was your second question? Oh, how did you, how did Afro-Asian themes become such a big part of your work? Yeah, that's, that's, it, it comes through, um, I would have to credit my, the uh, Fred Ho, who is Asian America's probably most very preeminent, uh, the late composer and musician Fred Ho. You know, he, he um, we had worked very early on with this kind of Afro-Asian and he, you know, he did a lot of study. I've since teach it, um, the Afro-Asian theory and history. So it was really to cre Fred's credit for his um, blazing the trail and he is he was courageous honest uh you know to the best of his ability and so i think he was inspiring for me but i you know then had to take i'm doing it in my own way and um you know i think it, as i see it it's a really important um conversation the afro and the asian because so often we're kept apart by the media and, you know, we have a lot of uh, knowledge to uh, keep developing in terms of understanding, because I think if Afro and Asian can understand, and there is so much evidence of it already, um, it kind of opens up the, the national dialogue and it's not confined to black and white. I think it's very important. Okay. Thank you so much. Is that good enough? <laughs> okay. Oh, those were uh, wonderful questions or answers. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll start with Diane's question. She says, um, what a blessing to be a collaborator and conspirator with Peggy. Uh, what is your reaction to the current situation and how will you embody your response? The current situation, is Di still here or did you leave? Um, I'm not sure what she means, but you mean the current COVID? Um, it current says she's still here. Oh, okay. So do you mean the election or do you mean COVID? I guess I'd like more specific current situation, what does that mean for you? 
I mean, all of your reactions to all of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I knew she was going to ask a really hard question. A really hard uh, question. When she asked my, the question, I kind of, you know. Um, my reaction is to stay calm. Because if I fly off the handle with every state's return of 10 more votes here, 10 more votes there, you know, I can drive myself nuts. So um, it, the calmer I can be right now, the better. To be rooted, to do what I have to do, but with a calm, you know, moan, heart, mind, with a calm, heart, mind. And that's been kind of my mantra ever since I did the greatest because that was the hugest challenge for me. And I learned to be, you know, unafraid and just rooted in my own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that good enough, Diane? <laughs> that, that's a good beginning. I'm, I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting to do the collaborative, um, whatever the next thing is. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. That was great. Thank Love you. Her. Yeah. Love you. Thanks for your question, Diane. Um, uh -huh. Bang Fei, do you want to go ahead and ask your question now? Yeah, such a pleasure to meet Feng Fei Miao, Professor. Um, she oh, was so warm. Yeah, thank you. Thank Go you ahead. so much, uh, Professor. To, uh, yeah, I just unmute myself. Thank you so much. That's such a, a fascinating, uh, like, uh, your talk as well as your improv dance. So I, I'm really interested in you are talking about how the, the women are empowering themselves or through dance, um, kind of similar to Emily's previous question about the function of dance. And I'm specifically interested in how you are seeing the women are empowering themselves through dance. Cause I'm also an artist. So I, I want, also wanna know how I can uh, I empower myself through dance. I just want to want to know your take on for that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Miao. Um, that is a very hard question to a answer because I think it's um, through your life's journey. You know, it's it, it intersects with dance, but it also is about how you deal with the daily habits or the daily problems. It's about how calm you can be in the middle of chaos. And so how do women, it's a, as a general question, how do women empower themselves? We have to support each other. It's a collective community effort. No one can do it alone. And I think that that's the spirit. I think that the, the women's spirit, um, I call it the yin spirit, you know, like yin yang is female, yin is female, the earth spirit is a acceptance of community, of willing to share. You're not the leader all the time. And, and that's how you get, how people can empower themselves to be unafraid. And whether it's artistic in dance or whether it is protesting on a street and not letting you know development happen, it, it's the, all the same almost. You know, There's really no difference between holding up a protest sign and creating a dance that you perform on stage because you have to be so brave to perform on stage, right? I mean, you know that, it's scary. And even creation is even scarier to me. <laughs> I just, it's so lonely and scary. And, um, you know, I don't feel as scared anymore, but it, I have had moments where I just didn't know, nothing was happening, you know, nothing was happening. And that's scary, but, um, you know, there are so many important issues now happening this week and after this week that if we just keep our gaze on what it is we want to happen in society, then the art can go along and help. Because if we don't know what the goals are, if we don't want to support, uh, I mean, not support or lead or anything like that, but the, the native land rights is so important. We need to listen to those elders um, and, and not have to answer, just listen and learn. And that's in a way that they're gonna share their fearlessness with us and we're all gonna benefit. And then as Patty could explain actually more of is that in the seventh fire, uh, Patty, you know how to better say it than me, this, the seventh prophet doesn't look like you know, looks different from the other prophets. So in the end, I would say that 
this is a global effort. It's, it's not only women, it's anyone who has a feminist perspective can, can be supportive of women. You know, it's a collective global effort and we need to interact and network with everyone around the world. And especially have leadership from indigenous peoples and um, African, African Americans in this country. Yeah. Wonderful. So we just have time for one no, more question. I don't know. Fang oh, Fei, did I answer? I'm not sure if I helped. Oh, Fang Fei, thank you for your question. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we we had a couple of just comments, people saying they loved your work and they were happy to see you from Anne Green and Heather Owens. And then we had a question from, a, I think, one of your students, perhaps a University of Madison student, Wisconsin Madison student, Santia Samlao. Um, and Satya writes, I, um, I remember you saying that now is the time for those seeking wisdom um, must ask the wise. When one of your connections and main sources of wisdom, knowledge of the past and courage is severed, how does one go about moving forward with what they left behind? How does one try to listen to the spirits of the ancestors when they can't be heard through the layers of scarring? Mm, beautiful, Satya. I hope you save what you wrote. That's really beautiful. Um, you have your own unique vision. Um, that's very important. And you ask a really difficult, honest question. And how do you look into the future? Sometimes it's mostly impossible. I, I don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow or in the next minute or in the next second. And so you just have to gather yourself, just assume the strength of your grandmother or the strength of the people that support you is there at your back. They're watching your back, but you have to ground in this very moment. And that's how the only reason, the only way to do that, I think, this is just from my experience is to be quiet, to be quiet, to try to lessen all the noise of anxiety you know, and just breathe. And that's really tough to do, I know, but you know, I'm always harping on you to practice, right? <laughs> practice, practice, practice is, it's meditative and it takes, it's really hard. So you have asked a very hard question and we can continue talking about later though. Okay, did I help at all? I hope, I don't know. It, it did it, it whatever the age is, you know, it's like we're starting in this present moment to root ourselves again and again and again every day. Um, yeah, I think these conversations will probably continue and which is wonderful. And many of us has met um, new colleagues and friends through your residency. So I'm so, you know, grateful that you came. Um, so I think finally to close and thank everyone, I'll turn it back over to Nojin. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Choi. This is wonderful. Thank you for sharing your amazing dance, your thoughts, and your uh, performances as well. And also many thanks goes to Emily uh, Wilcox uh, and also Professor Patty Lowe for your help with the uh, presentation uh, and talk today. Um, before we uh, finish today, today's program, I just want to um, give you a preview of another talk that um, the NAM Center will present on November 17th. Today we talk about the dance and social justice, then, um, then this talk will be about music and social justice. Uh, Sujan Huang, professor at uh, Indiana University, will present a lecture titled The South Korean Song Movement in the 1980s. It will be at 4.30 on November 17th. Thank you all for um, staying with us this Friday afternoon. And also thank you, uh, Kate, for helping with this presentation behind the scene as well. Again, uh, thank you, Professor Choi, for your wonderful presentation. Good night.